Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number nine in this series about the power of perfect love. And I hope you're discovering that there is a power in perfect love. And, you know, the one underwriting thing that I hope you got out of this is it doesn't matter that God loves you if you don't believe it and experience it. Uh, and, and one of the great problems of the 20th, 21st century church is that there are many things that we intellectually embrace doctrinally. In other words, we, 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 we believe that the information is true, but we do not believe it in our heart. Therefore, we do not experience it. Therefore, it does us no good. And then we blame God. Well, I don't know why it's not working. This should be working. I believe this. No, no. Uh, believe in your heart, by the way, is something that, that that is affecting you. It's affecting your identity. It's affecting who you believe you are. It's affecting how you live. It's affecting the way you make your decisions. Now, today, we're talking about the witness of the Spirit because this is so very, very important. We, you know, we've talked two or three times in this series. And by the way, if you haven't listened to, this, uh, to all of these free videos that we have out here, be sure and go to impactministries.com or go to drjimrichards.com and check out the video selection. We have all of these available for free, and we are trying to invest in everybody that we can. Share these with people who, who you think that, that can get some help from it. But today we're talking about the witness of the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit works in our life. Uh, he he is the mediator between us and God as far as, I mean, Jesus is the one mediator, I understand that. But as far as uh, working in our heart, the Holy Spirit is the one who works in our heart, manifesting the grace of God uh, in a way that we experience something and it actually becomes a power, a strength that, that works in our life. Now, the witness of the Holy Spirit is so incredibly, incredibly important. One of the things that the Apostle Paul tells us is that the, that the Holy Spirit gives witness that we are sons of God and heirs of God. And uh, you'll realize a little bit from this message today that that only happens if you live like a son. You know, a witness is not somebody that comes and lies to you. The, the Holy Spirit being a witness, he, he is here to testify on behalf of God and testify on our behalf, and he's not going to make something up just to make us have more confidence. That's not what a witness does. A, as we talked about in the last message, a witness is someone who shares and gives testimony to what they've seen, what they've heard, uh, and, and, and what they've experienced. Now, I'm just going to tell you, there are going to be so many times in your life that uh, that you're you're going to face situations, and they're either going to be overwhelming situations because of the threat that you face, or they're going to be uh, overwhelming situations that you face because of maybe some guilt and shame that you have over your behavior, over your lifestyle, over something where you 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 have compromised. And I'm telling you. Those are the times that most people lose their footing and actually begin this downhill spiral. And some people absolutely never recover from this condemnation. Now, we talked about the fact, and, this, and the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with torment. And it's talking about the torment of guilt and condemnation. It's talking about the torment that comes on us whenever we have done something wrong, whenever we are deserving. Of, of judgment. and But it tells us that that if love has been perfected in us, that it'll give us boldness in the day of judgment. And the King James says judgment, but actually that word judgment there would be better translated as condemnation. And condemnation is when uh, sometimes because of your behavior, sometimes it has nothing to do with your behavior. Sometimes it's just your beliefs. It's just your imagination. But condemnation and that's when you have the expectation of punishment for something you've done or something that you have imagined that you've done. And I'll tell you, condemnation can, can be overwhelming. It is what I would consider one of the uh, cancers of Christianity. When you don't have the assurance of God's love, the assurance of God's acceptance, the assurance of God's peace. And really, if you don't believe the covenant of peace and the gospel of peace, then the real truth is 
whenever your back is against the wall, you may you you may never ever ever come out of condemnation. If you've never read my book, The Gospel of Peace. Uh, you might want to read it because I'm telling you, when you know there's peace between you and God, you can face anything. And you can you can eventually come out of it. So we know that uh, we know in in this passage because we read all of these scriptures. And so we know in 1 John 4, 12, it says, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected. In us. So, so there is a way that we can know that God's love has been perfected. In us. This is not just a mysticism. This is not just some, some subjective random emotion that comes or goes for no particular reason. When God's love is perfected in us, we begin to have this confidence uh, about the fact that God really is in us and that God abides in us, but even more than that, that we abide in him and, uh, and we can overcome that, con that, uh, uh, that condemnation. He says, by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us the spirit or given us his spirit. So here we have that thing again coming in about having uh, having his spirit, and it goes in the very next verse and says, since this love has been perfected among us, uh, we can have boldness in this day of, of condemnation. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus relied on the witness of the Holy Spirit. Stop and think, man, he was surrounded by people uh, that wanted to murder him all the time, literally murder him, not just talk bad about him, not just hurt his feelings, not just try to destroy his ministry, but wanted to murder him. You know, several several years ago, I had a group of ministers, and it was kind of interesting. Eventually, it all got worked out. It took several years, and but one of the ministers that was in this group, he was one of the first ones to come and apologize to me. I mean, these guys hated me. I'm telling you, they hated my guts. And you know what? I, I'm not saying I didn't make some mistakes. I'm not saying I didn't do some things that that justified them having hurt feelings or, or or that sort of thing because I wasn't you know when I was when I was younger I wasn't all that tactful and uh uh but I'm telling you for years they had a bond they had an agreement that they were going to destroy me they were going to to destroy my ministry and you know when I would get invitations from a lot of these really big name preachers in America to go out and speak with them they would they would have people call their offices and send their letters saying that I was of the devil and that they shouldn't that they should never let me speak with him and all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, they did everything that they could do to destroy what little reputation I had. I had, and uh, you know, but that's nothing. That's just somebody trying to destroy your reputation. These people were literally trying to murder Jesus, and they were the most influential people in all of Israel. They were the leading religious people. And so Jesus, you know, remember, he is our model. He is our example. He, The way he won the battles is the exact same way we should win the battles. Now, we do it by his power. We rely on him. We are in him. We but we rely on the same Holy Spirit that he relied on. We rely on the same word of God that he relied on. Everything that Jesus did in his life to uh, obtain a victory was, in fact, exactly what we have to do. The only difference is we know that the victory is already ours because he has won that victory through the resurrection from the dead. But anyhow, so Jesus reference more than once those things which gave witness to his identity. Now, remember, it was always his identity that was in question. And you may not realize it, but I'm telling you, even for you, it's always going to be your identity. The, the challenge is, is to damage your heart. And your heart, more than anything else as a believer, is where you maintain your sense of identity. Remember, the Holy Spirit works in your heart. He doesn't work in your mind. You control your mind. The Holy Spirit works in your heart, speaks in your heart, and you determine uh, if you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit, if you're going to believe the Word of God. I mean, we are always in charge, but we can yield to the Holy Spirit, and I'm telling you, we can, we can experience the life and the power that Jesus experienced whenever he walked planet Earth, and actually, we can experience the resurrection power 
that he experienced when he was in fact raised from the dead. So Jesus, you know, he said, look, your testimony means nothing to me. You're a witness of me. What you say about me, who you think I am, this means nothing to me. He said, because there is another one that gives witness to me. And I think I've made some reference to this. I don't remember if I did it in the in this video, these video series, or if I just did it in the audio series. But real quick, like I'm just going to run through a few things that, that Jesus relied on to be a witness. Now, keep in mind, these things, and I'll, I'll try to touch on this, these things that were witness to Jesus' identity, they could only be a witness to his identity if, in fact, his life was in harmony with him. In other words, if Jesus has, had been an immoral man, the Holy Spirit could not have given witness to him that he was righteous. And, you know, I think sometimes we get this, this idea uh, that somehow that the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to comfort us by telling us lies, by telling us, oh, yeah, you, you know, you're a godly person. You're, you know, you're the righteousness of God. Well, you, you are technically, positionally. I believe the Holy Spirit will always take you back to who you are legally, who you are positionally. But the question is, what what about what is your lifestyle saying to you? What is the testimony that is coming back to you based on how you're living? So I'm just going to go through these pretty quick because I got some points I want to make here. First of all, Jesus pointed out the fact that the word testified of him. You know, he told them at one place, he said, he said, uh, he said, you search the scriptures thinking that you're going to find life in them. And he said, these scriptures, they speak of me, and you won't come to me for life. So right off the bat, he realized that the word spoke of him. You said, well, the word doesn't speak of me. Yes, it does, because the word tells us everything about how much God loves us, about what Jesus did for us, how Jesus died for us, how we've been born again, how we're a new creation. So the word speaks of us just like the word spoke of Jesus. Another interesting thing is this. Jesus never took the name of the Lord his God in vain. One of our greatest struggles that I see so often is that we take the name of the Lord in vain, and we take the name of Jesus in vain. You say, no, no I don't curse and use God's name. That's not, that, you know, I don't think you should do that, but that's not what it's talking about when it's talking about taking the name of the Lord in vain. God has these covenant names particularly, but any of God's names that express his character and his identity, for us to claim that we believe on the name of the Lord and then embrace doctrines that are inconsistent with that name means that we are vainly taking his name. And there are so many things that you hear from pulpits every single week, which that means we're hearing them, and they're in books that we read, sermons we listen to. There are so many things that deny that God's the healer. Oh, you know, God's probably making you sick. He's probably, he's bringing this on you. God teaches you by bringing trouble into your life. Or really, because my Bible says he's the God of peace. Well, you see, God is the, God convicts you by showing you what's wrong with you. Well, that's funny because my Bible says that he is my righteousness. And in fact, the apostle Paul in Romans 8 says, look, is God going to find fault with you if he's the one that makes you righteous? No, absolutely not. So we take the name of the Lord God in vain. We're not absolute about who God is. We're not absolute about who Jesus is. Therefore, we don't have that in our heart. That's not affecting us. That's not giving, that's not giving us strength. Another interesting thing, you know, Jesus said, look, the works testify to me. The works testify of who I am. So, you know, he, he, the miracles that he worked, he said, well, I'm no miracle worker. Well, you know what? What if God wants you to work a miracle? What if God moves on you to lay hands on somebody, get them healed or cast a demon out of them? or open a so blind eyes, or snatch a cripple up and help them walk, or, or to do something that moves you into that supernatural. So Jesus, you know, you know the, the words that he spoke, the way he treated people, the way he talked to people, his whole lifestyle, his entire behavior uh, was, a, was a testimony of, of who he was. You know, here's an interesting thing. The, the one testimony in this, these scriptures that we've read and every one of these messages so far uh, talks about how that nobody's ever seen God, but if we'll walk in love, you know, they'll see, they will see God in us. We will be the testimony of God here in the earth. 
So, and you know, Jesus himself was the one who said that, that, uh, uh, people will know and believe that we're really his disciples when they see us loving one another. And, you know, you, you, you go through all of these things about love and you say, well, wait a minute. It seems like maybe love is in fact, the most important thing that I need to be bringing forth or that needs to be coming forth as fruit in my life. Well, we talked about that last week, how that if you are not believing and experiencing the love of God, that's not going to happen. And, uh, you know, the Bible says we love him because he loved us first. So this whole idea that, look, look, God loves you, so it doesn't matter if you love him or not. That doesn't matter. And I understand when people are saying that they're trying to get you out from under the guilt and condemnation of, of, of an obligation to love him. But the other side of that coin is this, but still there is an emphasis in, in the gospel of our need to experience God's love, to see how much God loves us, and, and to uh, open our heart up so that we actually fall in love with him, so that, so that it, his love starts working in our heart. But listen to this. This is a scripture here that I just think so many people overlook, they misunderstand, but we're going to touch on it even if I don't have time to cover my other points in this message, because I talk about this, by the way, in the audio series, which I hope you'll get the audio series. And if you're interested in taking a deep dive in this, if you're interested in, in transforming your life through the love of God, download the audio series tonight, go through it. And I'm telling you, it's going to walk you through things that you, steps that you can take It's going to walk you through this. And when you purchase a, a series or when you purchase a book or anything that I've got, understand that 85% of that goes toward reaching the world. And we are reaching the world. We are raising up Bible schools around the world. We are raising up and developing disciples all over the world. So, so get, the, get the audio series, this downloaded tonight. And uh, uh, man, you can go back and forth between the audio and the video. And by the way, the audio and video are not just duplicates. I do have some overlap, obviously. But I try to never make them as duplicates because I want to, I'm trying to give you as much of this as I possibly can. All right, so look this way. John 15, 9, Jesus says this. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. And then he says something. So you abide in my love. Now, when you think about abiding in his love, I'm not sure what you think when you read that word abide. I mean, I... I think we all kind of have some different concepts of, of what that might mean. And uh, many of them are correct. Probably some of them are incorrect. But you know, the whole concept of abiding somewhere is to, is to be at home somewhere for, for that to be your natural habitat. So our natural habitat, our natural way of life, the place where we actually feel at home is in God's love. Now, we would have this tendency to take this and say, so really then, then, then the most important thing is that I am feeling God's love. Well, yes and no. Remember, it, you know, every, everything is a two-sided coin. Everything that God does in us, he wants to do through us. And the truth is, the only way we can receive uh, whatever it is that God's trying to offer us is when we are willing to give it away ourselves. You know, I think I shared this with you back at the beginning of this series. I'm telling you, this, I grew up rough. I grew up in a rough family. I grew up in a rough city. I grew up in violence. I grew up, I grew up afraid all the time. I grew up always having to cover my back. I always make sure that I wasn't going to get hurt. I was a runaway at 14 years old. I, I got news for you. Now, fortunately, when I first ran away, I got to live with, with my uncle. So I was pretty safe then. But from 14 years old on, I was on my own. A lot of the time I was living on the streets. I'm telling you, you're afraid all the time. You're always, you always got your back covered. So, so it took me decades to, to come out of all of the fear and, and dysfunction that I had from the life that, you know, that I grew up in. But I'll tell you, uh, when Brendan and I got married, first time in my life, I ever felt like I was in a, in a relationship that was based on love. First time I ever felt like somebody was with me because they loved me. Up until that time, people, anybody was with me in a, a in any kind of a, a romantic relationship. It was always codependent. It was always they wanted something I got. They wanted, you know, I was in a, 
I was in a band. We were successful. I made money, you know, all these kinds of things. So people, you know, I was a drug dealer. People want my drugs. So there was always some selfish motive that people had for being, for being involved with me. But uh, so Brenda and I get married for the first time in my life. I got somebody that I believe actually loves me. And so, so being in an environment where there was love and see, I couldn't see God's love. I knew he loved me. In Lex, I knew he loved me. I experienced his love on some level. But the more I could see love in somebody else, the more that influenced me and the more it made me look at and experience and value God's love in a different way. But the first uh, the the first New Year's, I think we were that we were married, um, we were praying and worshiping with some friends, and we were sitting around one night and uh, like I said, on New Year's Eve, we were praying, we were worshiping, and we we just all decided we were going to make our New Year's resolution. My New Year's resolution that night, and I and listen, that you got to realize this has been forty two years ago. And my New Year's resolution was that the rest of my life, every single day, I am going to do something that causes me to encounter God's love. And so I began this journey of wanting to know and experience God's love. And I started realizing very quickly when I started this pursuit that I could not receive that which I could not give. That's the universal law of the seed. You cannot grow something that you don't plant a seed for. Now, that you're not earning it. It's just the way the heart works. And so, so I want you to understand this right here gets into the law of the seed in ways that just beyond all that we can talk about. So he says this in verse 10, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So see, we would read that and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, we can't follow Jesus teaching. He's a teacher of the law. That ain't got anything to do with the law. That, that, no. Uh, I mean, it's, it's consistent with the law because everything that Jesus taught, everything Paul taught, everything anybody ever taught in the Bible is consistent with the law. Is it? There's a difference, though, between the law and legalism. So Jesus is saying, I kept, remember that word keep means to to hold as precious and to watch over it and 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 to and to maintain it. And that, that that whole thing about keeping gets into the whole idea of abiding somewhere, paying close attention. So he is saying here that and and honestly, he gives them incredibly strong words about whether or not we walk in love and how it will affect our ability to receive anything from God. As a matter of fact, in first John in first John chapter three, he talks about how that if we don't walk in love, we won't we won't have confidence before God. We won't be able to get our prayers answered. And that's not earning it. It's because of the way the heart works. But anyhow, when he says if you'll keep my commandments, you got to realize, remember, the 80% of the commandments we're telling you how to walk in love. We've, we've talked about this over and over again. I, tell you, I am sick to death of people trying to give us all these reasons why we should reject the law and the commandments. Now, we should reject legalism. We should reject the foolishness to think that we could ever be made righteous by the law and the commandments. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things about the law and the commandments or about how we try to use the law and the commandments. There's a lot of those things that we need to get rid of. But if we get rid of the law and the commandments, then the problem is we have no basis to define love. We have no basis to define mercy. We have no basis to define forgiveness. And so we end up creating these things that are outside of the word of God. So we become lawless. And the word lawless is in the Greek is anomia. And, and the lawlessness is, in fact, the primary thing that gives rise to Satanism. It is the primary thing that gives rise and facilitates the coming of the Antichrist. It is the primary thing that destroys civilization and that ultimately makes the world so corrupt that Jesus has to come back to deliver us. And so this whole idea of uh, uh, get rid of the law, don't pay attention to the law, you know, we don't obey the law anymore. Well, we don't, you know, people say, listen, I, I believe in faith righteousness. Well, you know, so maybe you should read your Bible because 
That's the only kind of righteousness God has ever honored. In the Old Testament, it says that the just, the righteous, live by faith. No one has ever been considered as righteousness or as righteous because they earned it from God. So he said, listen, if you keep my commandments, then you'll abide in my love. So this presents a couple of a couple of concepts here. Number one, if if I come up with definitions of love that violate the commandments, I I am not I am not walking in love. I can call it love. I can feel fuzz, warm and fuzzy about it, but it is not love. And so the, so the the Holy Spirit cannot give witness to my heart that 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 I am in God, that, that I'm abiding in God. And then I have no witness in, in the world around me that I am abiding in God because I'm not abiding in God because I'm not abiding in love because I'm not, I'm not abiding in love as God defines it. So, but if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in love. So first of all, I personally will stay in this realm of love. But besides that, I personally will be loving people the same way that God loves people. And when I love people the same way that God loves people, then I am abiding in his love. So this means that not only am I influencing other people, if in fact I continue to uh, keep his commandments, watch over his commandments, consider them as precious, hold them in high regard, utilize them. But I'm going to, I'm going to be able to abide in love in the way that I treat other people, but I'm going to be able to abide in love and the Holy Spirit is going to be able to give me boldness in this time of condemnation. Listen, I couldn't go through all, all the details of this message, but you can get this in my audio series. Listen, I want you to consider becoming a world changer with me, helping me change the way the world sees God, helping me touch the entire world. I'm telling you what, we are going to raise up one billion disciples to the Lord Jesus and I need your help to do it. So go to my website, consider becoming a financial uh, uh, world changer with us. And we're, we're going to touch people all over the world. All right. I'm so glad you enjoy this. Blessings to you. I will talk to you again soon. Share this with people that it will help. Mm -hmm.